In December of 2021, the world saw the cybersecurity equivalent of a magnitude 10 earthquake, a vulnerability so fundamental to the modern internet that it threatened to compromise the entire digital world. Today, we're looking at the story of the Apache Log4j, a modest, understated bit of software that is, to the internet, what Atlas was to the Grecian sky. And with it, this is the story of Log4 Shell, the critical exploit that brought the internet to the brink of total collapse. In the week leading up to December the 9th, 2021, users of Microsoft's incredibly popular game Minecraft began to notice something strange. By placing a quick line of code into their server chat box, other users were now able to take over the Minecraft server or even each other's personal devices. Once inside, infiltrators could do anything from installing unwanted programs to stealing information to, well, everything in between. It was a massive problem, and one that completely bypassed password protection and other forms of user authentication. Using the same exploit, Minecraft users have been able to take over web servers with server administrators powerless to keep them out. As catastrophic as this was for Minecraft, the initial expectation for the exploit was that it was a strictly Minecraft-related issue. Microsoft sent out a software update and declared patched versions of the game to be safe. But a slightly deeper dig into the issue revealed that the problem was much, much worse than most people had realized. The core vulnerability it wasn't a part of Minecraft at all. It was an issue with the Apache Log4j tool, an open source bundle of code that could be found on millions and millions of individual servers across the world. And these weren't just individual people at risk either. Apple's iCloud service, many Microsoft servers, Twitter, Amazon, IBM, Salesforce, Oracle, Tesla, and so, so many more devices were immediately put at risk. If hackers were successful in infiltrating any of those servers, they could have full run of the place for as long as it took them to be discovered and for them to be kicked out. The vulnerability uh, was only acknowledged on December the 9th when Chinese tech giant Alibaba released a statement on Twitter explaining what the issue was. Cheng Zhaozhen, one of Alibaba's cybersecurity researchers, had actually discovered the issue on November the 24th, a whole two weeks and change before the public became aware of it. But as cybersecurity experts were clued into the hack and began looking for signs of prior infiltrations, they found that hackers had been using the exploit since no later than December 1st. That meant that systems around the world were already compromised, with no easy way to tell what damage had already been done. This was a nightmare scenario for cybersecurity experts around the world, an easy, nearly ubiquitous exploit for which they had no immediate fix. Even worse, it was a nightmare that many people had known was coming, loath as they were to admit it. Apache Log4j was open source software, the kind of universally useful tool that software developers consistently needed and rarely felt the need to modify. Log4j was in so many places, even multiple places within individual servers or devices, and it had been used as a building block for a wide range of services that had been built and then all but forgotten, with little or no effort made to keep track. Log4j is just one of countless open source tools that have been bootstrapped into software across the digital world. The idea that a foundational program like it could be compromised and could compromise the entire internet wasn't new, it had just been ignored. And now, that was everybody's problem. So, so, at this point, we should probably take a moment and describe what exactly Log4j is, what was compromised, and why the issue was quite so massive. Now, obviously, we're not a cybersecurity channel, and we're going to have to indulge in some necessary oversimplifications in order for this to make sense. And look, if you do have a background in this sort of thing, rather than shouting me in the comments about how desperately I've oversimplified it, why not try and explain it to the people reading the comments? Now, the program at risk here is, again, Apache Log4j, which is a tool written into the coding language of Java. It is produced by the Apache Software Foundation, an open source consortium that produces large amounts of free-to-access software. Log4j's job is to log information about what's happening on a given server and write messages into what's called a log file. We will imagine the log file as sort of an internal notebook, one that developers can look back at when they need to debug a system or check that everything's been running smoothly. Using the Minecraft version of the exploit, we can imagine a player message within the chat as something that Log4j would write down. 
The problem arises when Log4j receives and handles incoming messages, because this process involves a little bit more than simple transcription. Before Log4j can log a message, it must first scan for anything within the message that requires interpretation. For example, the message might say, the user running Squarespace is insert user, and it's Log4j's job to complete the message. So it would say, the user running Squarespace is Simon the Fact Boy. Now, in order to do that, Log4j is able to execute commands that in incoming message might require. The problem with that is that Log4j has no way to distinguish an instruction telling it to identify a new user from, say, an instruction that would give full server control to a hostile actor. This means that the program is basically fully dependent on the kindness of strangers to make sure that it's directed to carry out harmless and productive instructions instead of malicious ones. But, well, this is the internet, and the internet doesn't tend to be a place that hosts the kindness of strangers. Developers can deal with the issue and take proactive measures to mitigate any damage that might arise from it. But as we already said, Log4j is everywhere. Even if every developer were as diligent as they could possibly be, that still leaves a glaring blind spot anywhere Log4j is incorporated into the remote or ignored corners of a server without the developer knowing it's there. Remember, this program is everywhere. It's open source, it's free to access, and it's easy to incorporate. So in most cases, Log4j went unprotected before this hack, consuming messages and spitting out results and continuing on its merry way. So then, the message Minecraft users were sending to each other begins to make more sense. This message was going to be encoded by Log4j, but before encoding, Log4j had to scan the message for any directives and carry out all the resulting tasks as expected. In this particular case, the Minecraft user's message carried a poison pill, one that the hackers knew Log4j would read and obey without a second thought. So, when they included instructions for Log4j to damage its own server or network, Log4j had no means and no reason to resist. Often, Log4j stopped writing to the log file altogether once it received a malicious command of this kind. Instead, it was set loose on its own local system, wreaking havoc internally with potential to damage a larger network. This massive flaw was the Log4 shell vulnerability. The malicious code written by attackers is specially crafted to appeal to the Java coding language. However, we aren't talking about hundreds and hundreds of lines of programming here, but quick, simple commands, and ones that can be very quickly constructed by a hacker with only a surface-level understanding of what they're even doing. We also aren't talking about just a single malicious command. Once the vulnerability was discovered, hackers could try out whatever commands they wanted, and often they'd work. Like we said before, the internet is both a good and a bad place, and one of the good or bad things about it, depending on who you ask, is the abundance of people who are more than happy to write out instruction manuals to help each other infiltrate vulnerable systems. The options for ingress included attacks like phishing, where the line of code would be sent to a user as an email, including the code as an account username, and exploiting chat functions like had been done on Minecraft. As long as a hacker could get a targeted computer's Log4j tool to note down a line of code, they were in. Hacks like this use what is commonly referred to as a zero-day exploit, an attack on a vulnerability that could be fixed, even quite easily, if the program developers knew it existed. The problem is, zero-day vulnerabilities are either completely unknown or have been found but not yet fixed. Other types of hacks force their way into a system or server akin to a home invader breaking down your front door with a crowbar. But with a zero-day exploit, the home invader picks their target by figuring out who in the neighborhood doesn't lock their doors. They obviously know they'll be robbing the place before the homeowner does, and with no locked door to stop them, they just walk right in. The hackers who had been using Log4 Shell were that same kind of invader, and some estimates put the total number of vulnerable devices as high as 3 billion, not to mention the massive number of companies and government servers that relied on Apache Log4j and other Java tools. Their ways in physical servers, virtual servers, internet connected cameras, and personal devices for the most part. As bots proliferated to continue the attacks, some researchers reported over 10 million global exploitation attempts per hour, with nearly half of the world's corporate network suffering at least one attempt. Hackers were using the exploit to gain access to sensitive information, infiltrate systems, launch other high-level cyber attacks, mine cryptocurrency, and do just about anything else that they could think of. They had everything. They could run whatever code they wanted. They had access to all data on an infected machine, and they could steal it, wipe it clean, hold it for ransom, or release it to the world. This was catastrophically bad, world-shakingly bad, and until Apache or someone else could create and distribute a patch for the issue, there was no way to stop the constant attacks.
In the weeks immediately following the exploit's release, system administrators found themselves at war with the world. Malicious actors, or benevolent ones, depending on who you ask, had distributed instructions to use the exploit all over the internet. Within 12 hours, tools were available online to weaponize the exploit, and those tools were out on the open market. Again, this process was really easy to use with even a basic knowledge of programming, so it was critically important that cybersecurity staff do everything and anything they could to plug the stops. Firewalls and other remedies could at least slow a hacker down, and in some cases they might have helped convince hackers that a certain system just wasn't worth their while. But the bigger the company, the bigger the target. And many hackers oh, would have been happy to work overtime if it meant getting inside Apple or Amazon. Until a critical patch came out and fixed the issue, system administrators oh, would basically be on their own. Around the world, the upper levels of industry flew into a panic. If you've ever tried to solve a complex maths problem while your maths teacher screams into your face, you could probably empathize with IT staff doing their very best to focus on the issue as CEOs and boards of directors went into a frenzy despite any lack of ability to control the situation. The exploit was rated a 10 out of 10 on the Common Vulnerability Scoring System, the CVSS, a severity assessment tool used across the world. As such, it garnered immediate attention from the entire cybersecurity world, with conjecture running wild over how bad the resulting attacks could be. This situation was a bit easier for massive companies with dedicated cybersecurity teams who could work out temporary fixes in the short term and reduce risk, but small and mid-sized companies were especially vulnerable, as they would have to wait for the official fix from Apache. The company was able to release a new patch within a few days of the crisis, officially taking the log 4 shell exploit from a zero-day vulnerability to a solvable issue. However, any cybersecurity expert will confirm that releasing the patch is only half of the battle, as you've still got to let massive numbers of users know that their systems are vulnerable. When we describe the panic over the Log4j exploit, we're talking about companies that were lucky enough to at least realize the crisis has happened, but many others, especially small businesses, might have no idea. Here, cybersecurity software companies and national cyber response teams took the lead, getting the word out to the world. Your system's compromised, and this is how to fix it. They were eventually successful in doing so, at least mostly successful, and with the mass patching of the vulnerable Log4j versions, the internet's close call came to an end. Two other Log4j vulnerabilities were also exposed during this time, with Apache able to keep up and address those less severe issues far more quickly. As for the damage, it's difficult to pin down an exact number or scale of the losses incurred by the exploit, but even conservative estimates suggest that the reported millions of hack attempts by mid-December was an undercount due to other hacks either not being discovered or not being reported. While the vulnerability itself was fixed fairly quickly, the loss of data, money, and other resources would take a far greater time to address. Some organizations and governments have released a public accounting of the damages. The United States Cyber Safety Review Board concluded that the U.S. government received minimal damage despite significant disruption and tens of thousands of man-hours dedicated to the issue. And in the same conclusions, the U.S. pointed out that the exploitation that actually took place was way less damaging than had been initially feared. Whether this was due to the wider internet world being a bit slow on the uptake, or due to a lack of reporting or disclosure of more serious attacks, it's hard to say. But what we do know is that among the attacks that actually took place, hackers created cryptocurrency mines, deployed various botnets, launched ransomware attacks, attacked important geopolitical targets, and introduced a number of secondary threats like viruses, malware, and second-stage hacking tools to vulnerable systems. Any number assigned to the total losses from the vulnerability would almost definitely be incomplete, but the impact was profound, both in terms of the attacks it allowed and the resources that it demanded to fix. Of course, the hack also had some lasting ramifications. Even today, it's unlikely that every single computer in the world has been updated from the old software, and any that haven't would therefore still be vulnerable to the attack. Not only that, but the entire style of attack, using a string of code to penetrate a vulnerable piece of software, will continue to be developed by hackers and may re-emerge with different code for different software. And finally, Apache Log J4 is open source and could conceivably have been used by server developers in places that the current administrators don't know about. If you can imagine discovering that a skyscraper used a shipment of poorly made steel beams, but you don't know where in the building those individual beams were used, you could probably deduce the importance of server administrators continuing to search for old versions of Log4j in places they don't expect it. And finally, Log4j taught the cybersecurity community and the hacking community valuable lessons, which both sides will continue to use. 
On the defense side, the attack was yet another reminder of the risks that ubiquitous, often overlooked programs like Log4j create around the world. And on the attack side, hackers had earned another reason to redouble their efforts in searching for zero-day exploits in existing programs. In terms of defense, cybersecurity specialists learned how important it is to understand multi-layered and chained attacks using basic points of entry and received a refresher on why exactly they should be preemptively hacking their own systems or finding help to do so in order to find out what exactly an attacker can access if they can find a way in. There were obviously a wide range of other takeaways from the hack, too myriad and complex to go into here, but suffice to say that the events and response were deeply educational for all involved. Mm -hmm.